Yeah, welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. It's 10 o'clock in the morning on a given Tuesday. And we're doing Life in the Law with David Larson from St. Paul, Minnesota. Uh, good morning, David. Nice to see you. Good morning. Although here it's afternoon. <laughs> I wish one of us is right then. <laughs> Online dispute resolution. You know, it's something that I've always wondered about. I've been waiting for this discussion for maybe 30 years. Um, because I believe that technology can, you know, get you much further. And technology for the law is, um, it's an intersection is what it is. And the further down the path we go, the more helpful um, technology will be. And I suppose, ultimately, there'll be a little black justice box. And you put all the facts and all the law in the little black justice box, and out comes a decision. We're not there yet, I know, but we can begin with um, the online resolution of arbitration, mediation, alternative dispute resolution, I suppose. Um, and you are um, in the uh, ABA uh, uh, section uh, on, are you the chair of I'm dispute also, resolution? Yes, I'm the chair. I'm oh, the chair. wow. Okay. So it's an honor to have you here. And so you must think about this all the time. Um, but why? Are you a, 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 an online dispute resolution person? Do you use it in your practice? Have you been developing it over the years? Yeah, well, I, I started getting involved with ODR back in 1999. Uh, I was teaching at Creighton University Law School at the time, and I had gotten a technology fellowship. Um, so I had a reduced teaching load, and I spent a year working with software and hardware, being introduced to technology applications. And as that was going on, I was thinking about dispute resolution in some way you could you could bring technology into dispute resolution processes. So yeah, I've been thinking about it for over 20 years now. Now, yeah. you've been doing it though. <laughs> I've only I been know. thinking about it. <laughs> I, I, and I have been doing it. Um, in September of 20, in October of 2016, I got involved as the American Bar Association liaison to the New York State Unified Court System. And they had decided at that time that they wanted to try online dispute resolution to address a real problem they were having with credit card debt collection. And all those cases were going to default. 94% of them were never filing the answer. So they wanted to increase access to justice, engagement and participation. They thought maybe if we go online, that'll do it. So when I started working with them in October of 2016, I never thought I would still be working with them, but I still am. And I'm meeting with them every week. Uh, so yes, I am, I am actively involved. So um, I, have, I know I'm gonna have many questions for you, but can you tell us how it works? how it works for um, the plaintiff, the defendant, um, uh, he or she who determines the facts and the law, and how does it pop out the other side? Yeah, a couple of things is that one thing that is true about online dispute resolution is that it's an opportunity to reimagine justice. So I don't think the goal is merely to move the offline processes online. The, the question becomes, is there something we can do that's more suitable to the online environment. So something that might be even more efficient or productive than the, the court system today. There's a lot of opportunities here. Um, so we spent a lot of time designing two platforms in New York. We started, as I said, with a credit card debt collection platform. When I first met with them, with them in October, I said, don't do that. I said, it's too complicated. I go, debt collection is heavily regulated at the federal, state, county, and city level. Um, there's no way people are going to be satisfied that what you're doing online captures all the consumer protections that we have. But they thought that, well, we do have a real crisis, and let's take a shot to see if we can help this default crisis by getting people engaged. Um, so we developed a really detailed program with several different levels. There's an introductory level with all kinds of modules about what small claims, um, but financial education, uh, hyperlinks to legal services. And so people would work through this first stage, and then they'd get into the second stage where they'd have an opportunity to engage in kind of what we call a structured negotiation, where it wasn't just free open, but it was more um, uh, kind of structured options uh, to pick replies um, and answers and questions. Uh, and the hope was that they could reach some kind of a solution that way. And then there's always an uh, online mediation option. So that was kind of the credit card debt collection platform. Uh, it, in the end, it wasn't well received. Uh, 
There were legal advocates who felt that it would be a disaster to put um, debtors into virtual spaces with debt holders. Um, and they fought the program pretty vehemently. One of the problems was that because we had to bid it out, because um, New York was going to build their own software platform, they didn't want to release the whole program, the whole software, because the feeling was that if we give it to the critics of the what they what they're hearing about the program and we show them everything that will taint the request for a proposal process because somebody will have gotten it early who knows who they gave it to so when it's released publicly some people will say well i never got that chance to look at it back three months ago so i'm at a real disadvantage so new york determined it wasn't appropriate to give it to a few people because a few people didn't see it, they didn't really understand all the consumer protections that were built into it. So they just said, this is, this is a nightmare, it's gonna be terrible, let's fight it, let's fight it, and they did. And you know, in the face of that opposition, New York decided, let's, let's pivot and let's do small claims. So that's kind of what I've been working on now. Hmm. Too bad, too bad, because they're uh, so closely related. Yeah, you know, I think it is too bad. Um, I, I, and here's why it's too bad because the, the, the opposition of the legal advocates was that when we represent a debtor, they always, we always win. And I think there's some truth to that because if you're in, a, in most debt collection cases, it's not the initial debt holder that's bringing the action. It's somebody that bought the debt, <clears throat> excuse me, later on. If technically, if you're gonna bring that case, you should be able to establish that chain of custody pretty clearly. You should be able to have good evidence and maybe even testimony from every previous debt holder. You got a $500 debt, $1,000 debt, and you're the fourth debt holder. You're not gonna do that. So they show up to court without that chain of custody. They have some documentation. The debtor doesn't show up at all. So they do, so they typically the debtor, the debt holder wins. But if they show up with an attorney that says, okay, show me the evidence of the chain of custody, the, the case gets dismissed. So it's true, they usually win. The problem is the one of the groups that who was, who was objecting to this proposition to go online was Claro. Um, and they represented maybe, I think on their website, they said 7,000 people over the last 10 years. Well, we're talking about 100,000 people a year. So that that's really a false comparison to say that, oh, the o ODR system, would isn't as good as when we represent people because the fact is you almost never represent people there aren't enough legal advocates to go around so, so the actual comparison should be between the odr system and what is happening right now in small claims court and what's happening now in small claims court is that debtors go to court if they show up at all and usually they don't in vast majority of cases they don't and get default judgments but even if they do show up they show up unre unrepresented the debt holder approaches them in the hallway says i got a deal for you you know, I'll give you 50 cents on the dollar if you sign this agreement now. Debtor says 50 cents on the dollar. That's a great deal. Um, so they sign it without really reading it, understanding it. In that, in that agreement they signed as an acceleration clause that says that if you're late on a payment, you miss a payment, then the full debt becomes immediately due. So they go back in the court that it's their case turn, the case is called. Uh, they say, judge, you don't have to hear the case. We already got an agreement to settle it. Um, we're all ready to go. Judge says, great. You now I got a hundred cases to look at today. So I'll, I'll accept your settlement and make it a court order. So now it's a court order. So now when mm -hmm. somebody does miss a payment or they're late, it's easy to get a judgment to attach property to garnish wages. Um, that's what's happening now. Um, and, and then people's credit report is destroyed. Uh, so whatever- Isn't that we, a fair deal? They got 50 cents on the dollar. Uh, there has to be consideration flowing both ways. If they're well, promising they to cents. pay, then they should play. And if they don't pay, there should be an acceleration. I'm, I'm a kind of debt collector person myself, you know. Well, I'm just saying that, well, my, the concern for me is that they don't get, they don't understand it. You know, it happens very quickly, you know, shortly before the case is called. They think that this is, this is a settlement forever for 50 cents on the dollar, they don't appreciate the fact that there's this acceleration clause. So, so I think that's the problem with what's happening. Um, and it's because they are unrepresented and they never will be represented because there's never gonna be enough money to provide an attorney for every debtor that goes to court. And so that's the reality. So the question is, okay, since that's what's happening is an ODR process that has several stages, one being kind of introduction to small claims court, um, an introduction as to um, kind of financial education as to what you should think about as to what you can afford. Um, 
a there was a section about legal defenses. You know, if your only income is Social Security, maybe that isn't collectible. There are some absolute defenses when it's a credit card collection situation. So some education about absolute defenses, none of which when you're in the hallway, show up by yourself, you know about. So you, you get a lot of education before you can begin the online dispute resolution process. Then you begin that. So I'd submit that that's better than the reality right now. So is it perfect? No. Sure, and there's no time. There's no time in the hallway, and there's no time with the judge to explain these things. That was, it would take forever to get through the docket. Yeah. Um, so this is a real benefit for, for really everyone. It's a benefit for the debtor because arguably he understands, and it's a benefit for the creditor because arguably there's proof that he understands, or at least some proof. Right, plus it's... Plus, there's there's a time period. It's not it's not synchronous. So you can actually take a little time to absorb it, to read about it, to think about it. It isn't like you know our, doc, our case is going to be called in 20 minutes. You know what are you what are you going to do? <laughs> You're on the spot, so you make the decision to sign the agreement. Now you got time to actually reflect on it, to think about what can I afford. Um, I shouldn't promise to pay more than I can afford, or at least I have to get a payment plan that's spaced out over a system, over a time period that I actually can manage. Um, those things can happen in an asynchronous online process that aren't happening in person right now. Well, let me ask you this: um, What about what about automating the whole thing? In other words, uh, the debtor, the creditor, they get on there, uh, they make a settlement, for example, uh, and uh, there's a judge, all right, but he's in his chambers. He's not in court, and he's just going through the records in this database and saying, this is okay, this is okay, this is okay. And he can, he can turn out hundreds of them every hour um, and make a judicial imprimatur on it, uh, make a judicial determination Everybody agrees that, that his determination is, you know, final or whatever weight of law it has. Um, and nobody has to stand up and go to court. And the judge doesn't have to spend his time with all the niceties in court. Yeah, so that credit card debt collection system I've been talking about didn't happen. So we pivoted to small claims. And we did that a few years ago. And that went live January of this year. So, um, or January of 2021. And uh, uh that system, now, it's a little different than what we did with the credit card debt collection. You start out and there we created some videos, um, so they're animated, that tell people about small claims court, tell them about on online dispute resolution, which was fun to do. We could do a storyboard and you know, build these animated characters. Um, and then, uh, 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 and you can start the process either in person or online. Um, but once the parties are engaged, now we start with a blind bidding process, so which is fully automated. And the, the claimant um, would make three requests for payment. It's like, what do you want to get? What are you willing to receive? And you do three successive bids, each being a little more gracious in terms of the, of the debtor. And the debtor makes three offers saying, okay, here's what I would like to pay. Um, here's what I'm willing to pay. And then again, does it three times. And so we go through the process that's all automated of trying to match it up. If there's an overlap, then you have to make some strategic decisions. Do you want to just split the overlap? Do you want the overlap to be from what they want to pay? Do you want the overlap to be from what they would be willing to pay? Um, we decided to look at the overlap. If there's any overlap on what would you be willing to pay? We decided to just split it down. You could argue about whether it should be a straight split. But if you get that straight split on the amount, that's all automated. Now you've got an amount. Okay, you're willing to pay this amount, and both sides are happy about that. So then the next step is a structured settlement negotiation where the parties get options as to number of payments, when the payments start, uh, how long will the payments be made, what happens upon default, are you just going to be liable for the settlement amount? Are you be liable for the original debt? So all of that you can work through back and forth. And it's all, again, asynchronous, all structured. If you agree to an amount, um, or let's say you can't agree to an amount, those two things, um, or you agree to the amount and you're going through all the terms and you just can't agree on the length of time. Debt holder says, I got to have a new year. Debt debtor says, I got to be two years. So at that point, there's a opportunity to do an actual direct 
exchange communication called the last chance option to say, okay, we've closed this deal this far. You know, the reason I keep asking for two years is because I have this obligation. I'm going to be, uh, for whatever reason, it's got to be two years to put it out there, see if the other side is, is amenable to that suggestion. So that's the- Is this so in person those, or by email? So that's it's all happening um, all by uh, nothing, nothing, nothing synchronous yet. It's all asynchronous. There's no video component to it. So you do you kind of type out your last chance option, which is okay because you have some time to reflect on really word it the way you want to word it. Other side can decide whether they want to accept that last offer. So what might have happened? So you might have option number one. You settled on the amount. You agreed on all the terms. If that happens, then all of that auto populates into a settlement agreement that basically mirrors the settlement agreement that you'd get um, in court. Um, and, and that just goes to the court and the judge looks over and signs it. So that, that's fully automated. So the judge never appears in court? You never appear in court. Um, you know, what's interesting, let me uh, throw a thought at you, and that is this. Sometimes when you're negotiating a settlement of a dollar amount, um, the structured payment feeds into the dollar amount. What I mean is, so I'll pay you $100, um, but if you give me terms that I like, I'll pay you $150 because I really care about those terms. Um, if, if we follow the sequence you're talking about, you never get to the structured uh, payment amount until after you settle on the dollar amount. So you lose the benefit of, um, you know, integrating all of those issues in one decision, no? Well, you don't necessarily lose it. Um, and the reason I say that is because, so let's say you can't agree on the amount because of the considerations that you've just articulated. Um, at, that up, at that moment, there would be an opportunity to go straight to online mediation, where at that point, you really do have much more of a free-flowing conversation with an online neutral again. Um, uh, generally, it'll be asynchronous, uh, but it could be synchronous, depending on what that online mediator wants to do. In New York, um, we're working with two community mediation centers, the New York Peace Institute and the Long Island Dispute Resolution Center. Um, and they've worked with the Small Claims Court for a long time. They're very experienced. Um, so, so you don't, so let's say you suspend those concerns. You don't necessarily lose them. So, so version number one. You, you, you agree on the amount through blind bidding. You actually are successful uh, typing all the terms. You get the terms you want. They all auto-populate into a settlement agreement, goes to court. Nobody ever appears at court. That's fully automated. Option number two, you just can't agree on the amount or you agree on an amount, you can't agree on the terms. Then you get this thing called, this option called the last chance settlement option. Or at that point, then it is more of free flowing negotiation where you could say, the reason I'm, uh, you know, I, I'm willing to pay you more, or if you give me the terms I want, or whatever, whatever contingencies in play that you have not been able to reach in the structured part, you can now express that. So that's going to be um, that's going to be captured there. Um, so you don't necessarily lose it, but you can't bring it in initially. I guess would be the way to, to phrase it. Okay, let's uh, let's go to a situation where uh, you say that I owe you two hundred dollars. But I say uh, I don't think I owe you anything. Uh, I think you're out of you're out of school on this. You have no claim against me, or you treated me unfairly, or I never received the goods, or whatever it might be. Um, sort of an uh, you know an absolute uh, defense. Um, okay, this has to be decided. Now, does does the, does the system you're describing uh, wrap around for that? We're not talking about structured payments. We're not even talking yeah. about a settlement. We're talking about either zero or the, the whole thing, I suppose. Yeah, I mean, if, if the parties can't come together, either through the automated part or through the mediator, then the case goes back to court. Um, so, you know, and that actually through the pandemic was a little, that actually was a challenging part of the whole equation during the pandemic. Because one thing with online processes, you always have a, a question of engagement. And if you're a defendant, it's like, why would I engage? You know, if I engage, if I never engage, you can't find me. I don't have to pay. So why would I ever want to answer this? Why would I want to engage? I mean, some people want to get it off their back, so they will engage. But many people would say, I don't want to do this. Um, 
uh, you know, what's in it for me? The, the longer I run away, the better off I am. Well, as, as long as we were assigning court dates, we could say that, well, here's why you should engage. This is going to be a lot easier on you than having to go down into Manhattan, find a parking place, take a day off work, find childcare. Do it because this is easier for you. Because if you don't, you're going to court in six weeks. So people would say, okay, I'll try it. No, I don't want to have to go to court. But when you, but during the pandemic, they weren't having court dates. They weren't having hearings. So it's now it's like, oh man, what are we going to do? So we thought, well, we'll create what we call the online settlement date. And we'll say, okay, we'll give you two months to kind of work it out. But the problem is there's no lever at the end of it to say that, well, if you don't, here's the consequence. So during the pandemic, it's been a lot harder to get people to be engaged because there's no threat at the end of the session that if you don't do this, you're going to have a worse alternative. Um, we're just getting to the point where court dates are starting to be scheduled again. And I think that's going to help with engagement because people will understand that if I don't do the process, I'm going to have to go to court. I'm going to take a day off work. I'm going to have to show my face. I'm going to have to get shamed. I'm going to have to do all those things I can avoid by staying online. So, but but is, is it, um, this is, the whole thing is an option, right? I can opt out. I don't want to, I don't want to be troubled. Leave me alone. I'm not signing anything. I'm not going to a website. Yeah. A, yeah you, I mean, you definitely, I mean, you just, right. You can just, you can make offers that no one's going to accept. <laughs> I, mean, you I mean, you know, we hope you do it in good faith, but again, if you're not motivated to avoid going to court, you can kind of uh, you know, ignore the system. Um, well, do you, do you tell them, I mean, how do you reach them to say, you know, the, the really simple message, if you don't want to participate uh, either in court or by this uh, online system, um, this is what's going to happen to you. You know, yeah. there'll be a default judgment. Uh, debt collectors will be chasing you around. Uh, in all 50 states, you'll be subject to that. And it will follow you all the days of your life, uh, or at least for the period in which the judgment yeah, is valid. It's, because it's the court system, you know, they're uncomfortable sending that specific message of the consequences. I mean, there is a message pretty aggressive saying, now, it wasn't this aggressive until relatively recently, saying that, um, so we still do service of process, the, the clerk's court still does. Um, so they do uh, do a physical service of process letter. And with that letter, they also have the information about the online dispute resolution process and explains what it is and how you start it. Um, again, it's like any other settlement, you don't have to settle. You can always go through court if that's what you ultimately want to do. Um, we're hoping you'll try it because hopefully you can reach some kind of agreement that maybe you'll be surprised. It's something that you actually can manage and is acceptable to you. But if you're adamant that, you know, you got the wrong person, I, I don't even know why you're chasing me, um, that you can't be forced to settle. Um, you will end up going to court where you then will have to make your defense that you got the wrong person, but, um, but the process doesn't force you in any kind of a settlement. Or if you don't go to court, you could wind up with a default right. judgment. No, that's so right. Things. right. So you, is this the law in the state of New York? Well, it's, part, it's officially part of the court system now. It's it's a step in the small claims process. So uh, I, don't, I don't know if you call it the law, but I guess it is the law because it is part of the small claims court process now. Um, again, with the understanding that there is no binding consequence if you can't reach a solution voluntarily. Mm -hmm. So um, the only consequence is you will end up back in court. Um, I'm really curious as to the what happens if you don't agree, but you submit to mediation or arbitration. Arbitration, is arbitration included uh, in this system? At this point, it's not arbitration. It's just the opportunity for mediation. Okay. So who, who does the mediation? Um, volunteer lawyers, perhaps? Or some yeah, well, it's those two, mediators. How does that those work? two community, community mediation centers, um, which is our experienced mediators, the New York Peace Institute and the Long Island Dispute Resolution Center. And, uh, and there's, there's so many issues and questions to talk about. Um, New York doesn't have staff who are doing mediators. Some court systems do. And it's all kind of more of a closed system. It's not there. 
um, which means that we had to do a little more work to build a platform for now two independent community mediation centers. We had to build a dashboard for them, um, a case management system for them, um, train them on it. So it was a, another step uh, in, in what actually has been many years now in terms of trying to build a system. Well, do you find a, a, a small percentage or maybe a larger percent of cases are resolved by the mediation uh, in lieu of just a, uh, you know, offer counter offer arrangement? Well, we don't have, you know, we just don't have the numbers yet. Um, yeah, one another challenge has been when you do an online dispute resolution process, you have to make a decision. Do you want to build the software and platform yourself or do you want to go and use an outside vendor? It'd be very expensive to build it yourself. Um, you have to maintain it. You got to make sure that you have a staff that isn't going to turn over. Um, so you got to have a succession order. So it's always operational. So most court systems are saying, with the exception of Utah, I think it's the only one that built their own. Everybody else is saying, okay, we use an outside vendor. So there are two that have been kind of dominant in the United States. Um, uh, Tyler Technologies bought a system called Modria uh, that had been independent. And then there's Matterhorn, also known as Court Innovations. So we decided to go with Matterhorn. But again, now you're working with an entity that's outside of your control a little bit. They're an outside vendor. And uh, New York has been very careful about um, building in protections. We didn't mention this just, but we have hard opt-outs and soft opt-outs. Earlier you mentioned opt-outs. So if you're represented by an attorney, um, if there's a history of domestic violence, if there's a protection order, um, there are certain, a few handful of situations that are they're just hard opt-out. We, you can't use the online dispute resolution system um, if these things apply. Your case is over ten thousand dollars, so there's a, there's a handful of those. And then we also have a, a series of soft opt outs. Where uh, do you have difficulty communicating in English? Do you have difficulty uh, using a computer and accessing the internet? Um, you have about five or six soft opt out questions, and I say soft opt out opt out because if you say yes. We don't, unlike the hard opt-out, which means if you say yes on these, you're out. We give you the opportunity to say that even though you've said yes, would you still like to continue? Because it may be that even though you might have difficulty representing yourself in English, your spouse or partner or your friend helps you all the time. And you just, you can do fine that way. And even though you might have some uh, disabilities or impairments that make it difficult for you to work on a computer, you might have assistive devices that help you. Um, you might have some other person that can help you. So we give people the option to say that even though I have answered yes to this question, I'd like to stay in the process. Um, what about the other states? What about, you know, here you are in St. Paul and, and what the ABA is in Chicago um, and there's New York. What about you know the 49 other states? Uh, are you working with them? Do they have similar systems? Uh, uh, there are systems under the ABA or yeah. otherwise. They're sprouting up all around the country right now. I mean, we're right in the in this whole embryonic period where people are first debating whether or not they want to try it, and then debating how sophisticated they want to get. I'd say I would say that what we've done in New York is is infinitely more sophisticated than other systems, which are much more simple. Just come on, you know, exchange some bids and we'll see what happens. I mean, we do, we do all this preliminary education. We're doing all these screening questions. Um, you know, we have multi-levels of blind bidding and structured negotiation, and last chance and online mediation. Sounds so like a game is, show. Yeah, it's, well, it's not a game, but, um, but the funny you'd use that word because as we think about engagement, um, we did think about um, contacting gamers, game, the gaming industry. You know, you've got World of Warcraft and all these games where people will sit there for 48 hours and keep playing. So what is so attractive about those games that we might be able to borrow to keep <laughs> people like games in our dispute? Yeah. It really sounds, it sounds like this, that's a, an essential element going forward. But you know, I wanted, to, I wanted to take a minute here and talk to you about the future, uh, David. Um, so uh, talk about my little black box on the hill. Uh, where you put, you know, data in, you put facts in, hopefully you can settle on facts. Uh, sometimes that's hard. Um, and um, then, of course, uh, there's applying the law such as it is and having somebody apply the judgment uh, and come up with a decision and the dollar amount and uh, who knows what. 
Um, you know, and it seems to me that if you, you know, I know there are, as you said, there are some organizations that are programming sort of, um, uh, you know, national, potentially national online systems. But suppose I'm a, a young programmer just out of school, took computer science, know a little about the law and, and courts and the like. Um, and I take it upon myself to write up a whole big kind of wizard. And it asks me a lot, of, it asks each side uh, a lot of questions. It calculates the credibility of the questions because the, sometimes the questions repeat themselves. Sometimes the questions are calculated to see if the answer to the earlier question was correct and so forth. And, and then when it gets a, a handle on the facts, um, it applies the law because, you know, it can go into the legal reference services online and it can pull out some law. Um, and then it goes to, uh, I guess, a, either a person or maybe even, maybe not even a person. Maybe the thing could have artificial intelligence and it could make a presumptive decision. And maybe you can appeal that if you don't like it, but at least you have a presumptive decision all pretty quickly. And as you say, uh, asymmetrical. Um, so that it's, it's back and forth, uh, law, facts, decision, and judgment, but uh, with the right of appeal. Sure, so that's, I'm, that's I'm thinking in the future, that's got to be coming down the pike. Yeah, sure it is. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, the only concern about that, it's, you know, data, you know, bad data in, bad data out. So to the degree that there's any possibility that any of those prior cases have involved in um, any element of bias in terms of conscious or implicit, um, when you, you're you going to perpetuate whatever problems that have existed before, if that's all you're doing. So yes, I think that's inevitable that that kind of thing is going to happen. But I think we have to be vigilant to look to see what kind of databases we're building and whether or not we're building in some biases that maybe we we would like to avoid, and maybe you know, in real time world, we're actually getting our arms around a little bit and understanding, and maybe we would end up backtracking if we just start building these these databases built based on earlier precedent. Very exciting. So you'd have to find a system to identify implicit bias, um, which I think could be done these days with the tools that we have. So will you be there, David? Will you be there following this? Uh, will the, the uh, online dispute resolution committee of the ABA uh, be looking for solutions, looking for yeah, I'm, programmers? I'm, I'm pretty sure I'll be following it just because I never <laughs> thought I'd be following New York for six years. I still am. Um, now, I, I guess if New York finally um, shuts their system down, I'll have nothing else to do. So, so I guess I'll just move on to the next one. <laughs> I think it's, it's been very exciting. Uh, what about what about lawyers in general? This is my last question to you. Um, are they are they comfortable? Uh, you mentioned there was a certain amount of opposition in New York uh, to the credit card credit card vendor situation. Um, but you know what what do you get? What's what's the feedback? Do they like it? Do they not like it? And after all, it, it may be eating their lunch in some ways, um, and maybe they have resistance to it. Uh, is that so? And how do you deal with it? Well, you know, one thing that, um, you know, one of the concerns with the credit card debt collection was putting, you know, unrepresented debtors in with experienced debt holders. In the small claim system, no attorneys are allowed. So that concern is taken away. The other concern is not insignificant. The idea that the more we automate, that means some work's going away. I think that's going to happen. There is going to be, when you think about you think about TurboTax, um, basically that's taking tax work away from tax attorneys because you're doing this these th threaded um, kind of knowledge engineering where you ask one question, you get a certain answers that lead you down these decision trees. Think about estate planning, you think about lots of law where that's going to be possible. So we're going to see more of that. And what I tell my students is that prepare for that and start thinking about how you can position yourself that you won't become obsolete in five or 10 years. Um, you've got to think about what are the, I mean, there's a lot of things that depend upon human engagement and dispute resolution. Sometimes it's not always, because you can automate some, but not all. There's times at which you're really going to need some kind of human engagement, some compassion, some empathy. Um, there's going to be places where attorneys are going to be necessary. And also in terms of 
any system you build is going to have to be updated. Um, you know, the, the law changes, the law has to be monitored. You want to see the data that you're building on. Somebody's going to have to do that. So there's going to be places for attorneys and legal educated individuals, but it may look different. And you have to think about where I fit in. Oh, that's such a valuable, such a valuable piece of advice, really, for law students uh, or lawyers who are trying to find a way in the profession and in the society. Uh, it just bespeaks of one more question. I, I, let me let me uh, just ask you one more question. And that is, uh, from what you've seen uh, from the point of view of the ADA, ABA, uh, and the point of view of, um, you know, the profession in general, and I guess the, 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 mm, the, the process, the, uh, um, you know, um, the experience of it, do we need legislation uh, to perfect this sort of approach, what you're talking about, to make this change worthy, to, to you know, complete the process, so to speak, as it exists now? Um, do we need yeah, yeah. new legislation think, on the on the state side, the federal side, or both? Well, I think we, I think we definitely need something. Um, you know, even right now, it'd be helpful to have some got some clearly articulated guidance. I'm actually co-chair of an ABA task force to write standards for online dispute resolution, and we're working on that now. Because the fact is, when you bring in technology, the, there's a possibility for for tremendous abuse. Years ago, a colleague of mine wrote an article about the media, mediator's dirty secret. And the fact that a mediator in a face-to-face -face interactive session can do a lot to influence going on just by your expression, by your timing, by the way you have recesses, by your reframing, you can do a lot in terms of changing the course of that. Well, you throw technology into there and your ability to use a voice synthesizer to change your tone. I mean, there's all kinds of things you can do if you're not monitoring it. So I think that, yes, we definitely are gonna need some kinds of guidance. Maybe it'll have to be in the form of legislation. We are debating right now whether to call it guidance or standards. And if standards sounds a little more formal, a little more enforceable, um, then the question becomes, should that be legislative standards? Should this be um, standards of an association like the American Bar Association? Should it be ethical principles? But uh, the kind of bottom line is, I think, yes, the idea of just free form anybody doing what they want is really dangerous. And we do need some kind of standards guidance and maybe legislation. Would it be better if this was made consistent or around the country? Or, or do you think it can vary from state to state and still be effective? I think at this time, we definitely the idea of variation is good because we need to look at a lot of different models and see what seems to work best. So I think that you know, decentralizing at this early stage and letting court systems kind of tailor their dispute resolution systems to what they consider their own needs are is a good idea. Well, thank you, David. Uh, David Larson, professor at uh, Mitchell Hamline School of Law um, and uh, the chair of the ABA Committee on Online Dispute Resolution. Thank you so much. I think this is a very important function um, of the bar and of the uh, ABA. Thank you so much, David. Yeah, thanks, Jay. Thanks for inviting me. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.